All right. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Gnostic Studies. And today we're going to start our first class of Gnostic Runology. If you're on the website, you just go to the top menu on the far right there under Alchemy, Runology. Um, so we're going to read a couple pages today. The, the whole series, we're going to go through it this way, top down. Uh, we may be adding some more pages or, or modifying them as we go, but this is the general pattern that we're going to follow. And if you have any questions or comments, you're always welcome to leave them in the comments area. So the purpose of this course is to study the two primary authors that, that we study in almost every class, Wiracocha and Samaelo and Veor, and their information on the runes. But if we look at Wiracocha, whose um, excuse me, other name is Arnoldo Krumheller, what we find is because he spoke German that he read other German authors, such as Siegfried Aldolf Kummer, Inst Tristan Kurtzon, and Perit Schu. Uh, they're German occultists. He, Wiracocha supposedly published books by the last two, Perit Schu and Ernst Tristan Kurtzon. He had a publishing company in uh, Germany. And then those authors also read other German authors, such as uh, Gorsleben, Rudolf John Gorsleben, Frederick Bernhard Marby, Guido von Liszt, and Frederick Fischbach. So we're going to look at them as well um, for their historical value, and we'll see if they add to the to our understanding, obviously, in our opinion, they do. That's why we're looking at them. So we'll see your opinion. As we study these German authors, we can follow the thread of development of the runes into what they become because they convert into um, exercises, pa practices, uh, incorporating the, the shapes into body postures. And then there's mantras associated with them. There's also uh, just understanding the shape itself and what it, it corresponds to. But what happened was in Germany in the late 1930s, or I should say early 1930s, late 1920s, Wiracocha began teaching in other another continent. He was in Europe and then moved, I mean, he, he lived in Mexico and, and traveled around South America, but then he moved and, and took these teachings into Europe, or I'm sorry, from Europe into the Americas, over to to uh, all of his FRA schools, which stands for uh, basically Rose, Ancient Rose Cross Fraternity, but in Spanish. And when he did that, he kind of created this very interesting thread of development because then other authors, including Samael and Veor, who attended his FRA school in Colombia, were able to access these uh, very, um, very particular things. I mean, if you remember, let's say it was approximately 100 years ago, uh, they didn't have the internet. It wasn't easy. They didn't have a program that could do translation for them. You know, if, if somebody wanted to read something in another language... You either have to hire somebody to do it for you, or um, and you'd have to know somebody, which you may not even know how to do that, how to find them, uh, and and then it's with certain specific things, the language may not be easily translatable. In order to translate the concepts, they may have it may not be translated literally. So in any case. Wiracocha spoke German, so he was able to do that translation himself and, and bring over a lot of interesting information into the Americas. 
and create a, a different thread of development. And so we want to understand the history and all this and see these, these German authors and their influence on Weracocha and his influence on uh, Gnosis and Gnosticism so that we, when we read him and uh, Samael and Beor, we, we see what they're actually talking about because it's, it's actually very deep. And if we don't do this, this other uh, reading, we, we don't see that depth. And so it actually really adds to what what we have, uh, what we normally access. So we invite you to, to join us and, and read along. And hopefully with it, we'll get to learn how to practice the runes and incorporate them into our lives. So let's see a little background here. Wetakocha, the runes, and hermetic masonry further explained. We're talking about hermetic masonry because it's another course after, if you want to study from left to right in our uh, series of classes here, after we study tarot and Kabbalah, the next one is really Hermetic Masonry. And after Hermetic Masonry is Runology. We don't always do them in order, but uh, that's why we're touching on Hermetic Masonry. Many people wonder how the runes are related to alchemy and masonry but a deep analysis of these fields will show their connection. Weracocha, Arnoldo Krumheller, says the following regarding the relationship of masonry with the runes. We have been guided by our instincts too much, forgetting that we have intuition as a prominent divine factor which can guide us. But intuition does not work for us if we do not do magical exercises. We should study the movements before we do the exercises, and this has always been the privilege of the initiatic societies. Then, these exercises and everything that we do, like the steps and movements in the different Masonic degrees, are not only psychotechnical practices, but they're also practices that can take us to a superior state of consciousness from the commonly known state of consciousness. That's from a, an article that he published in his magazine, republished in English in a book called The Gnostic and Esoteric Mysteries of Freemasonry, Lucifer and the Great Work. In his Gnostic Rosicrucian Runology, the English translation of his uh, runic course, on the same subject where Dakocha says, No modern mason suspects that their signs of recognition are nothing more than the descriptions of runes and that the primitive masons took these signs from the Druids. In the Druid lodges, these explanations are given. So, as we mentioned, Samaelo and Veor studied at an FRA school in uh, Colombia, where Huerdecocha was creating you know, material for, for all these different schools, and so was able to access it. In the 1960s, we don't know the exact date, but uh, he gave a lecture and he says the following. Do not forget the mantra, brethren, a formidable mantra with which you can awaken your great powers. The important thing is that you practice. There are many mantras related with different powers. One must learn to speak in the verb of gold of the first instant. The mantras are syllables of a great universal cosmic grammar. The most pure dawning of the divine language is sacred. In ancient times, there was only one language. I am referring to those times of the first and second races. The only one language, then only one language was spoken. Even at the beginning of Lemuria, a divine, ineffable language was spoken. That language had power over fire, air, water, and earth. This is the language of light. For example, if I want to say in the language of light, I, Samael and Veor, am here fulfilling a mission, or I am here fulfilling my duty, then I would say, I, Samael and Veor, Masleim Urim Seuduad. That is to say, I am here fulfilling a mission with sacrifice. Do you understand? 
in such a way that it is a complete grammar, a whole language, and it has a precious writing. The Nordic runes, for example, belong to that primitive cosmic grammar. Dr. Krumheller said that the Nordic runes were older than the Hebrew letters, and he even affirms that the Hebraic letters are only a caricature of the Nordic runes. In any case, the Nordic runes belong to the cosmic grammar, to the great universal verb of life. May God grant that soon we will be able to give humanity a book on runes. I wrote one, but I have not been able to print it yet. The day will come when we will print it. The Nordic runes are very important. Dr. Krumheller wrote about the runes. His course on runic magic is marvelous. There is no denying it, brethren. So you see there the lecture is numbered 193, Practical Nature of the Message of Aquarius. He mentions Dr. Krumheller Wittekocha's class, his course on runic magic, and he says that it's marvelous. So that's one of the reasons that we're reading it. In December of 1968, Samael Vior was able to publish a book on the runes that was entitled The Christmas Message 1968 to 1969, The Magic of the Runes. This is the cover right here. In this book, he gave practices for many of the runes, as well as other relevant information for understanding the profound esoteric significance that they have. The first edition of the book had no pictures with body postures in the text itself. The postures appeared on the cover, which had this drawing here on the right, uh, which was said to have been made by the author himself. This drawing also appears on the back cover of the third edition of an earlier publication by the same author, Igneous Rose. That book was first published in 1954, and it does have mention of some runic practices and mention some runes in there as well but uh, it was only in the third edition that it had this picture and that says that the uh, sacred ABCs the sacred alphabet we could say so the this runic course so we're going to look at our study plan what we're going to do there's about 42 classes right now, so it's going to take a little bit. We're considering doing two classes a week. But in any case, um, right now, we're, we're, uh, we're going to look at the way we've divided up the class. We can really divide it into three sections. The preparation, which talks about Gnostic anthropology, Nordic mythology, and other esoteric information related to Nordic culture or Nordic tradition and the, the sort of uh, archetypes that they have, which becomes useful for us when we're trying to understand um, certain things that have emerged from that culture. And we want to look at the historical perspective wherein these runic exercises that went over from Germany into the Americas in the, the 19, early 1930s where they came from. We begin in the early 1900s. With those, uh, with our study of, of the runes specifically. But we need to understand the historical perspective that got us to the place where we start. So really this preparation includes 1700s and 1800s. Just looking at cultural and religious development in uh, Europe, because what we see is the emergence of what we now call the New Age movement. You know, a lot of which, as you as you know, is um, not high grade, not good quality. But um, people using words and, and saying things, and um, unfortunately, wasting everyone's time, including their own. But uh, that. That New Age movement that's a legitimate thing and that when we study esotericism for some time we can start to taste that flavor of the genuine New Age movement uh, which in Gnosis we call the Aquarian era that, that emerged in really the mid-1800s in our opinion but because of other things that had been going on in the past 
in the um, you know in in religious and cultural spheres. So we'll talk about that when we go into detail about the historical perspective and cultural influences. But that'll get us to the 1900s, early 1900s. Then we'll look at the early 1900s and, and what happened and German runic ideas that began in the early 1900s. And then the, the, that sort of uh, specific then. We're going into who, who are these people that are influencing uh, general concept of runology, of, of runes, what they are, their use. Um, you know, it's related with something called the Volkish movement. And we'll go into that as well. Because we can see that as a role, uh, the role of, of the Volkish movement and of runes in it, leading to uh, uh, deviation into eventually something that was co-opted by the Nazis and uh, eventually World War II. So we want to look at that. We want to study that too so we can understand what happens when we get fanatical. We want to understand the need to um, really be balanced when, uh, with our study, and that we're, we're open to looking at these things from different perspectives. We're open to studying things that other people, maybe they're afraid to study or they're taboo for somebody else, but we're willing to look at it because we need to be thorough, because we need to understand, we need to comprehend. So that's what we're here to do, and that's when we're going to do our in-depth study. We're going to look at basically different authors, the German authors that we mentioned already, uh, five, six authors, and then the and for a specific rune, we'll look at what each one of them say, and then we'll look at what Wiracocha and Samaelo and Veor say about them. So we'll kind of read them in chronological order. Um, yeah, and and so I, I think you'll enjoy it, but it's going to take a little bit of time. The point of this is to say it's going to take some time before we get there, because first, what we're looking at is just how how did this emerge in this particular way in Europe in order for it to then move over into the Americas in the uh, early 1930s. So we want to look at that. We want to see that. So before we get there, we're just going to look at the different runes that we're working with. There's lots of different families or, or runic alphabets, whatever you want to call them. And these are the ones that we are going to use for this course. Some like are called Germanic or Elder Futhark. Elder meaning it's, it's older, meaning it's a, it's a more ancient one. And then there's a younger Futhark, which is meaning that it's, it's newer. Uh, there's Anglo-Saxon runes, you know, Nordic runes, Danish runes etc. And so they have some variance, variability. Some of them are always the same. Some of them differ from, from one period to another. But the system that we're going to use is these 22 that you see here. Some of them have, have duplicates or, or different shapes, modified shapes. And the point is not to get caught up in those shapes and say, oh, this is the right one, this is the wrong one, but just that there is some symbolism with the shapes, and we're going to look at that as well. Um, but that that there's different runes, and there's also runes that we don't study here in this course that are worth studying as well. But according to the information, the research that we've done, we're going to be working with and studying these Gnostic Rosicrucian uh, family of 22 runes, which was taught in Wiracocha's uh, Fraternitas Rosicruciana Antigua, the Ancient Rose Cross Fraternity, or FRA, institution. And in our study, we're going to read from these authors, uh, Frederick Fischbach's Origin of Gutenberg's Letters. It's a very interesting book that um, most people that study runology have never really heard of unless they're German. I'll say that uh, doing some research on the internet, sometimes it links to, to an Amazon page. You know, whatever with, with whether or not that's accurate. But in this case, sometimes people put comments on there. So somebody commented on another book and said, they commented on Guido von Liszt's book, and they said, 
oh, uh, it was all in German, but you run through a translation program, you can figure it out. And it was saying, oh, this guy copied from this other guy. You should look at this book. So this book is out of copyright, at least in the United States. So we were able to download the book and uh, run it through a translator and get some useful information out of there. And he does have some very interesting information. I would say he is more um, more Gnostic than, than uh, I would have expected. Uh, but then one of the more popular authors, Guido von Liszt, and when you start studying renology, is uh, he's he's almost always mentioned, and even Germans, who uh, who for example aren't, in a sense, affiliated with the Volkisch movement or or don't see the Volkisch movement as something useful, uh, consider him to still be a master with his his wordplay and his uh, way of using the German language, which is of course a different way of of doing things that he's like a, a sort of a poet to them. Uh, his Maybe his most famous book, the, the Mystery or Secret of the Runes. I think in English it's often called the, the Secrets of the Runes or The Secret of the Runes. And he's got some other books, The Pictographic Script of the Aereo Germans, the Aereo German Hieroglyphics. That's a very interesting one, not easy to, to translate through the translator. And then The Primordial Language of the Aereo Germans in Their Mystery Language. So, but we we tried to extract some useful parts from there, from what we could find uh, and reference. But you see here, there's a couple, uh, we start from 1900, 1907, 1910, 1914. And then in 1924, Ernst Tristan Kurtzon wrote a book called The Runes as Salvation Signs and for Unbinding Fate. It's also sometimes translated as The Runes as Holy Signs and lots of fate. He had cards in the back that you could cut out of the uh, of the book or or um, like paper. You could cut it out and put it on some cardboard or something and make like rune cards, and then do do uh, divination with it. Uh, Gorslebin, nineteen thirties. He had a book, seven hundred some odd pages. The peak time of humanity, or the zenith of, of mankind. That that one's been translated by a guy that was really into the runes and taught runic practices. Uh, just died, I think, last year. Actually, an older uh, German-speaking person. But that's a very interesting one as well. He kind of combined a lot of what other authors said into, into a, a very thick book. And then... Siegfried Adolf Kummer, he wrote two books, Holy Runic Power or Holy Rune Might. I did find an English translation of that, uh, but I think it, it was on lulu.com, but it's since been become unavailable, so I don't know how easy that one is to get. And then Rune Magic, you should be able to find it. There's PDFs of that one. One of them is the Body Postures, the other one, I think it's the rune magic, is hand posture. So there's like hand signs that you can make in order to do runes. Very interesting. We will look at that as well. And then, of course, Arnaldo Krumheller, Huerta runic course, sometime between 1931 and 1835 is when it was published. But it was like a private uh, course that was only accessible if you went to these schools. And they were, of course, only in Spanish and only in certain parts of the world. And then, Samael and Veor, he has a lot of books that mention the runes. Uh, in 1954, two books, Manual of Practical Magic, Igneous Rose, then in his book, Christic Willpower, or Christ Will, sometimes it's translated as. Uh, he has talks about it. Of course, The Magic of the Runes, 1968. Esoteric Course of Kabbalah, he talks about it. Secret Doctrine of Anahuac. Mayan Mysteries, Tarot and Kabbalah. So he mentions the runes, and we've tried to compile that information together so we have it all in one place. So if he talks about a rune, we can look at what he says in each one of those, unless it's redundant. Uh, and then, of course, we won't uh, just repeat the same information over and over. But if it's if it's you know relevant, then we'll, we'll do our best. And finally, Glorian website, if you don't know about it, then check it out. 
It's a really good website. It was, used to be called Gnostic Teachings. Now they're just calling it Glorian.org. You can click on this and go to that website. They have a whole series on the runes. Very, very helpful. And we use that for some of the runes that we didn't have a lot of information on. We reference them and, and we cite them because they were very helpful. And we want to give them a shout out. So let's jump into it. First class. That was just a warm up. The runes and the first root race. If you have any questions or comments, let us know. But we're going to keep rolling today. Creation and the Gnostic Paradigm. We studied in the Hermetic Masonry series, according to Gnosis, that the universe that we now live in was created in an alchemical way during the dawning of the cosmic day. Seven so-called cosmo-creators worked by performing special rituals in order to fertilize the chaos and for existence to surge forth. So this is a quotation from... Uh, Chapter 24 of Initiatic Path in the Ekrana of Tarot and Kabbalah and Chapter 2 of the Kabbalah of the Mayan Mysteries. Seven temples were established in the chaos for the construction of this solar system. The chaos is, is the cosmic matter before it's organized, before it's given order. So it's, it's called the chaos. So it's sort of like the uh, undifferentiated matter. Seven temples were established in the chaos for the construction of this solar system. The cosmo creators divided themselves into three groups in accordance with the sacred law of three. A priest, a priestess, and a neutral group, which we could consider something like a choir, chorus, or a congregation. Then they all sang the rituals of fire within their temples and thereby fecundated the womb of chaos. And thus, the universe was born. Samael talks about these uh, rituals of fire and says that they were Masonic rituals. Right? What is a Mason? It's someone who works with rock, the stone. And if we study the Hebrew Bible, we learn that uh, Jesus talks about building his church upon a rock. So we've, we've mentioned these similarities before in, in this esoteric symbolism before we refer you to the Tarot and Kabbalah courses, and the um, Hermetic Masonry series to study more about that. But what's of particular interest to us is the specifics about creation. So the creation occurs thanks to, to a singing and working with the fire uh, and doing certain rituals. And then every he says every planet develops seven root races and seven sub-races. Our planet Earth already has developed five root races. It needs to develop two more. After the seven root races, the planet Earth will become a new moon, meaning it won't have life. The first root race on our planet was the so-called polar race and was protoplasmatic or protoplasmic. During that time, the Earth was submerged within the fourth dimension. This was a very civilized, semi-physical, semi-ethereal root race. The first root race lived on the sacred island situated in the northern polar cap. That island still exists, yet it is in a jinn state. That is, it's within the fourth dimension. So let's see if we have a little graphic. So the idea being that things descend, they start off the polar race, then the Hyperborean race, then the Lemurian race, then the Atlantean race. Everyone now on this planet is the Aryan race, not just one uh, ethnicity. Then in the future we'll have an a astral race and then a mental race. So, the Aztecs state that the human being the human beings of the first root race were extraordinary dark-colored giants and that they had a gigantic civilization. The rituals and the wisdom of their culture were prodigious. The language of the protoplasmic race was the verb of gold, a universal and cosmic language whose combinations of sounds 
produced cosmic phenomena of all kinds. Singing in this language, the parents of the gods taught the gods the cosmic laws of nature. They spoke the language of gold, and they wrote with runic letters. Their civilization was not degenerated, nor was their manner of perception subjective as ours is today. They had objective perception. In that epoch, the rituals of the polar temples were all runic. The movements of the officials were runic. The runes are the divine script. Let us remember that the swastika is a rune. The cosmic rituals of that polar epoch are very interesting. In the temples, the trained clairvoyant can discover pure occult masonry. Nevertheless, those rituals differed so greatly from those that currently exist in the world today that it would be impossible for the modern mason to admit that these rituals were Masonic. The lights of the temple were not fixed. No sooner had the Venerable Master occupied a throne than he would abandon it. Sometimes the first vigilant occupied a throne to later change it for that of the second vigilant. The high dignitaries levitated in order to exchange amongst themselves their ceremonial positions. On their vestments, which means like their uh, ritual clothing, the colors black and white were combined in order to represent the struggle between spirit and matter. The construction of the temple was perfect. The symbols and the tools of work were used inverted to represent the drama that is projected into the centuries, the descent of spirit into or towards matter. Thus, we may contemplate with surprise inverted scepters, inverted chalice, etc., everything inverted. Life was, at this time, descending towards matter. It was necessary then to give symbolic expression to this. Right? This is what we mentioned before. It's descending into matter, into physical, the physical world. Descending. The sacred processions were grandiose. They made the great mysteries and the supreme descent of spirit towards matter understandable. This was a magnificent event that was awaited through the course of the centuries. It was awaited with as much yearning as is today the return of the human being to the superior worlds. Right? We have to reascend. Now spirit needs to reascend out of matter. The first root race was devoured by the tigers of wisdom. The region of the first root race was the god Tezcatlipoca. Tezcatlipoca. Each individual of that race was a master of wisdom. The second race was governed by Quetzalcoatl. This was the Hyperborean humanity. They were wiped out by strong hurricanes. The third was the Lemurian race, who inhabited the continent of Mu, which today is the Pacific Ocean. They perished by fire raining down from the sun, volcanoes, and earthquakes. This root race was governed by the Aztec god Tlaloc. The fourth root race was the Atlanteans and was governed by the Aztec god Atonatiu. It finished with a great inundation, a flood. Right? We've all heard of the, the flood in different religions. The pre-Columbian tribes of America are descendants of this root race as well as the primeval Chinese and Egyptians, etc. We are the fifth root race, that is to say the Aryan race, that is to say all of humanity, regardless of skin color. The present Aryan race will end with a great cataclysm, which has been described as the 13th Katun or Ahau Katun. Now, keep in mind as we said before, that the Nazis took some of the language, some of the esoteric language, some of the esoteric symbols, and they used it and perverted it, we could say, or deviated it. 
And so we'll see that the term Aryan actually uh, was used before, before the Nazis in Germany, and uh, Blavatsky used the term as well. So this is not something that's unique to uh, Gnosis. The sixth root race is called Koradi. It will exist after the cataclysm of the fifth root race. It will live on a transformed earth. The seventh root race will be the last one. Afterwards, the great cosmic night will arrive. So remember, we read at the very beginning that there was a cosmic day, the dawning of the cosmic day. And then the cosmo creators fertilized the chaos, fecundated the chaos, the womb of the universe. And then what happened? Then there was creation. It passed through these phases, mental, astral, etheric, physical, and then it starts to fold back up and return where it started, etheric, astral, mental, and then it will be the cosmic night. Again, so cosmic day, the dawning of the cosmic day, and then here we have the, uh, the sunset of the cosmic day, and then it's the cosmic night. Because of the poor achievements in former rounds, the scantily developed planetary fire of our Earth became overcharged with karma, thus producing, in our physical world, a slow, heavy, and terrible evolution. Therefore, due to the planetary karma and the coming rounds, I'm sorry, the coming rounds will accomplish very little because we have to pay a lot of karma. We have to learn how to pay karma, not create more karma. The gods of nature had worked very much in order to create self-conscious beings. The gods have performed difficult experiments within the laboratories of nature. However, it is good to know that the struggle in order to, do, to create true human beings has not yet finished. Since the human being, or the so-called human, has to ditch, discharge a lot of elements that will be present in the zoological gardens of the future. The kingdom of Malkut, physical world, is a terrible filter. Whosoever wants to be free of this fatal wheel of samsara has to dissolve the ego and incarnate their soul. Those who achieve it are rare. The gold, the select, the true human being is the one who has their soul and their spirit incarnated. They are awakened within the internal worlds after death. That was our first class. We have this uh, handout. If you're interested, you can download uh, a page that has this information. We're going to read another page here. A further Gnostic explanation of creation. Let's see, it looks like there's a problem with the the chat there. There's a problem with the chat in uh, YouTube. So we may not be getting your your questions or comments there at this time, but we can take a look afterwards and respond in the comments at that time. All right, so we've, we've gone through this class, this class, and now we're doing this one. Further Gnostic explanation of creation. The universal fire of life is the Fohat, which is also called Maha Kundalini. It has seven degrees of power. O oh, Devi Kundalini, you are the fire of the seven Laya centers of the universe. The seven Laya centers of the universe are the fire's seven degrees of power. Seven churches exist in the chaos where the seven planetary logos officiate. These seven churches also exist within the spinal medulla of the human being. They are the seven churches from the book of Revelations in the New Testament. The seven planetary logos officiated in their seven temples at the dawn of life. 
the seven holy ones practice the rituals of Maha Kundalini within the sacred precinct of their temples at the dawn of the Mahamvantara, the cosmic day. The material universe did not then exist. The universe solely existed within the mind of the gods. Nonetheless, for the gods, the universe was ideal and objective simultaneously. The universe was, yet it did not exist. In Gnostic Kabbalah, the Ein Sof, the Ein and the Ein Sof Aor, are collectively referred to as the Absolute. Within the bosom of the Absolute, the universe is, yet it does not exist. It does not exist yet, we could say. To be is better than to exist. The seven holy ones fecundated the chaotic matter so that the universe could emerge. The fire's seven degrees of power divided the chaotic matter into seven different states upon which the perceptions of our seven senses are based. The seven igneous serpents of each of the planetary logos fecundated the chaotic matter so that life could emerge. The fire put the cosmic scale in motion. That is, the fire, which is what they used to create, put the cosmic scale in motion. The cosmic scale is karma, the need for balance, equilibrium. It created that. By there being creation, there has to be equilibrium. The chaos is the raw matter or raw material of the great work. The chaos is the mula prakriti, the primordial matter. Mula prakriti is Christonic substance, the seminal energy from which the universe emerged, right? That seed energy that exists in man and woman. We have mula, prakri mula prakriti in our sexual organs, and from it, life springs forth. We can create a life with that energy, a life in the external world. Or we can create in our internal universe as well. We see seven sacred vessels filled with this Christonic substance on the altars of the temples of the seven planetary logos. That is the sacred symbol of Mula Prakriti. Those are the primordial waters of life. The water is the dwelling of the fire. The one who wastes the water also wastes the fire and remains in darkness. The seven holy ones fecundated the Christonic substance of the universe so that life could spring forth, so that life could sprout. The yogi and the yogini have to fecundate their own primordial waters. Right? He's talking about those of us who want to work with that substance. We have to fecundate our own primordial waters, man and woman their own Christonic substance with the grandiose power of Kundalini. Kundalini is the spouse of Shiva, the innermost, the Purusha. Kundalini is the spirit of electricity. Electricity is the sexual power of Maha Kundalini. Kundalini is coiled within the Muladhara Chakra, the church of Ephesus of Revelations, it is the serpent whose tail is coiled three and a half times. When Kundalini awakens, it hisses as the serpent hisses. The prana, the buddhi, the indras, indriyas, the ahankara, the mind, the seven elements of nature, the nerves, are in their totality products of kundalini. Kundalini is intimately related with the prana that circulates throughout the 72,000 nadis or astral conduits which nourish the chakras. We could say there may be something like acupuncture points, but they're, they're not exactly the same. Um, I've seen some books that say that the acupuncture points are based on nadis. But the idea is that there's these points all over the body that have certain effect and they can absorb or 
uh, emit energy. And they can be used to modify the energy in the system, in our organism as well. In those sacred temples, the seven holy ones within the chaos, there was an... In those sacred temples... In those sacred temples of the seven holy ones within the chaos, there was an ineffable lady next to a logos. Indeed, the separated sexes did not exist. However, the ineffable gods knew how to polarize themselves in accordance with the necessities of the moment. The Elohim, or Prajapatis, are hermaphrodites. One Prajapati, or Elohim, can draw forth their masculine or feminine polarity, they know how to polarize themselves. This is how the seven planetary logos could draw forth their masculine aspect. That is how their Isis could draw forth their feminine aspect. So they would polarize themselves into male and female, their masculine feminine aspect, in order to work with the sacred fire. Now our disciples will understand how, inside each one of the temples of the chaos, the gods worked in couples, chanting the rhythms of fire. Groups of children, Prajapatis or Elohim, formed choruses with these ineffable couples, the sacred Triamazikamno. Triamazikamno is the law of three. We mentioned it before, related with the trinities we find in religion. The sacred fire emerges from the brain of the father and from the bosom of the mother. This marriage of the sacred fire fecundated the mula prakriti so that life could emerge. The raw matter of the great work is the crystonic substance, the seminal energy. The raw matter of the great work is the mazar of the gods, the sea of milk, the fountain of milk and of coagulations, the waters of amrita, it is the sacred cow from whom life emerges. These are all the symbols that are given in other religious systems. These are the primordial waters that have deposited within that we have deposited within our sexual glands. Let me read it again. These are the primordial waters that we have deposited within our sexual glands. The verb of the gods fecundated the chaotic matter so that they could emerge, so that life could emerge. The throat is a uter uterus where the word is gestated. The throat is the sexual organ of the gods. The sexual magic of the verb fecundated the chaotic matter so that life could emerge. The creation of the universe was the outcome of the sexual magic of the verb. The entire universe is granulated Fohat. Remember what Fohat is? The fire that we talked about. The primordial matter. Let's see what it says up at the top. The universal fire of life is the Fohat. The entire universe is granulated Fohat. The entire universe is elaborated with the granulations of Fohat. Here's a graphic from Elphos Levy. Oh, it's got what appears to be water here. Trying to talk to us about the, uh, the positive and negative, the polarities there. In any case, we also have a handout for this class. We're going to stop there. The next class we'll read next time is we'll start studying the Edda, which is a Germanic text or a, we could say a older text related with a, a religion that we don't necessarily know a lot about from uh, Europe. So we invite you to join us for that. But um, for the moment, we're going to we're going to stop and we want to open it up for questions or comments. What is the symbol on top? Symbol on top of that graphic that we were just looking at from Elphos Levy? Is that the one you're talking about? 
is a snake biting its tail and then he's got a crown with a plus on top and it has three levels is that what you're talking about right above the tree of life the symbol on top of the tree of life that's the the ein that's what we call the absolute the ein the ein sof and ein sof awur so it's before creation there's this thing which we can call the absolute and then uh, when creation starts to manifest which is supposed to be symbolized by this kind of a explosion or whatever you want to say like spark then there's a uh, then it divides into three which are the three primary forces oh that's cool All right, uh, we're gonna try and refresh this page with YouTube, see if, if the comments show. I don't know what it'll do to the stream. Hopefully it'll keep it constant. Uh, see if we got any questions or comments there. We do. Uh, somebody, uh, oh. You got holy rune might, nice. No, I think we have it in um but uh but it's just hard to find. But yeah, if you wanna ask for that, then somebody in the chat has it. But but uh we have it on our end. Another one. In the polar epic and the hyperborean epic, our human forms were not yet individualized or physicalized. They were all physically connected in a hive mind. So how did their temples work? Uh, I'm, I don't know about that specifically. Um, my guess would be that uh, they were connected to the universal mind. I don't know that it's the same thing as a hive mind. Uh, so how did their temples work? I mean, we'll have to investigate that for ourselves. But... Um, it seems like it would work through some kind of religious symbolism. I mean, I mean, religious rituals, which is what, in some sense, Masonic rituals are, are an expression of uh, symbols that are important and that transcend language. So usually, the the symbols that are that are carried out, played out in one way or another, are very uh, profound because of that if we associate it with the religion that's one thing because maybe that gives us an explanation but otherwise it, it may just be that we feel it in the interior in our interior in our heart so to speak and so as a result of that we say wow this is uh you know something special or something different it makes sense to me and that's that's a lot of times why we want to study comparative religion or go to another a place or study something different from what we grew up with so that we can see how other people touch divinity or or experience that relationship with divinity hello uh, is it possible that they were connected cybernetically I'm not sure what what that means analog cybernetic technology oh is it possible that they had digital cybernetic technology yeah it's certainly possible that they made uh, robots and had complex robot stuff certainly possible I think I read somewhere that uh, and of course not everything you read is is uh, accurate but that in the Atlantean epic, they were they had robots and they were working with elementals of uh, plants or animals and working with them together, like combining them together in some way, which isn't necessarily recommended uh, as a practice. But but yeah, so the, but the point is that they had, according to that author, they had robot technology in the previous. Uh, root race
Doesn't look like there's any more questions or comments at this time. We want to encourage you to read the material on your own, to uh, send us emails if you have any questions or leave a comment, gnosticstudies at gmail, or just leave a comment and we'll respond to it to the best of our ability. And with that being said, we're going to sign off for this evening and we want to invite you to next week's class, same time. We're going to try and keep it going, keep the momentum with this so that we can continue to, to cover this very interesting material. And with that, we want to wish you the best with your esoteric work. Until next time.